Hello, everybody. Welcome to Legal Hacks for Creators with Beacons and Julian Serafian of For Creators by Creators. Hello. We are so excited to be here today. Um, we're going to give just like one or two minutes for a few more people to trickle in and like land on the page so that um, nobody misses the very beginning of the presentation. But we're super excited. Uh, to have you guys all here today. Thank you so much. I always just really appreciate everyone who takes the time to register for these webinars and join us live. You guys are the best. Um, so let us know in the chat uh, where you're from, where you're calling in from today. I always love to see that. I'm uh, here in snowy Minneapolis. We've got a little dusting uh, this morning that's making it feel like winter. Julian, remind me where you're from. I'm in Santa Barbara, California. So. Oh, wow. Pretty different. <laughs> Not as frosty. Yeah, it's 75 and sunny today. <laughs> Indeed. Winter. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a nice nicer place to be. I was chatting with a creator yesterday who's in um, South Florida, and she was telling me this is the time of year that she really most appreciates being from a warm climate when other people start complaining. So. Oh, I bet. I bet. Great. Well, it looks like we are at a good number of people who have joined us here. So um, I think we can go ahead and kick it off um, and get started. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Isabel. I'm the Beacons Community Manager. Uh, I put together these webinars. Um, oh, somebody just mentioned in the chat, can you all see anything yet? Um, if you're on this page and you're not seeing us live, you might have to enable your video or audio. Um, there's a place to unmute. So just make sure you've done that if you're looking for us. Okay. I don't know. That's probably not super helpful. I should put it in the chat. If they can't see me, then they didn't hear me say that. <laughs> um, I, so I, know. I will know. do that. I will do that while I kick it over to you, Julian, to introduce yourself um, and lead us into your cool. wonderful presentation. Sounds good. Hello, everybody. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. I hope, uh, I hope your creating career is going smoothly. I know it's an exciting time to be a creator pretty much on any platform because there's just so much action and the industry continues to industrialize. And, um, and part of that industrialization is why I'm here because um, you know I got into being a, an attorney for creators after seeing how the creator economy really lacked fundamental legal protections for creators, even though content creators are you know walking small businesses. And we're gonna talk more about what that looks like on the legal side in this webinar, if you guys have any questions or comments in the meantime, while I'm talking through these slides, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm not going to be looking like super constantly as if it's a Twitch stream, but I'll check in on it. And, uh, and of course, there's a Q&A at the end, too, and we can get into any more in-depth questions you have uh, at the end. So let's dive right in. First, who am I? Hello, I'm Julian Serafian. As I said at the beginning, I, uh, I'm an attorney, obviously, graduated from Harvard Law School in 2018. I worked at Wilson Sonsini, which is a big law firm up at Silicon Valley. They handle primarily technology companies and startups. I did that work for about three years before I quit during the pandemic to explore other endeavors and work on my mental health, which had taken a, a deep battering during the pandemic, as I think it did for a lot of people. And, um, you know, in that process, I became a content creator kind of by accident. I started talking about mental health on TikTok. I went viral several times. I built an audience there and I started getting brand deals and I was like super excited. This is great. This is what it is to be a creator and actually build a career from it. And when I got these brand deals, I started realizing that these contracts were half baked and to the extent they were doing anything, they were ripping the creator off, but advantaging the brand uh, in every possible respect. And that's when I decided that I don't want to put my legal degree to use here to help advocate and protect creators. It is great to meet all of you, albeit virtually. Okay, let's talk about something that most creators should seriously consider when they are deciding at that inflection point whether or not this is going to be something semi-permanent, right? No longer just a hobby posting on TikTok once a week, but maybe I want to make this a stream of income that's going to last one, two, three, five years. And it's creating a corporate entity. And by corporate entity, we're going to talk about what that is in the next slide, LLC, C corporation, partnership, et cetera. But first, I want to talk about why you even do it, because a lot of people, they see it and they kind of vaguely understand. But at its core, the benefit of creating a corporate entity is that it shields you personally from potential liability in your business dealings. What does that mean? 
Well, let's say you do a deal with Coca-Cola and something goes sideways. Coca-Cola decides they want to sue you for $100,000. And let's say you don't have any corporate shield at all. So it's just you as a creator. Coca-Cola, if they actually get a recovery for $100,000, can theoretically go after all the money in your bank account, all of your assets like your house, any rental properties, your stock portfolio, your car, your computer, your jewelry, anything. Nothing is off limits if it's you personally that is signing on to a contract. Now, let's contrast that to when you have a C corporation or an LLC or a partnership. The benefit of having those entities sign on your behalf rather than you is that the only thing that Coca-Cola could recover or any person that is suing you can recover are the assets that that corporate entity holds. So let's say you have an LLC. That LLC has 5000 in the bank account. Coca-Cola sues you. They win the lawsuit. They are owed $100,000. The only thing they can recover is whatever the LLC owns. In that case, it's the $5,000. They cannot come after your personal assets anymore because it wasn't technically you that signed onto the contract. Personally, it was the LLC as a legal entity. And so that's, that's the main advantage. It's, it's reducing risk for yourself and liability for yourself in the business of being a creator. Now, all, you know, it, it's, it, it's worth mentioning is the risk super high here that you're going to get sued as a creator in the course of your work. No, you know, not yet. I think the industry is still very young. It's a wild west. And what that means is there's not enough money and value yet for these big brands to sick their legal teams on small creators. But as time goes on, you're going to see a lot more litigation in the space from brands towards creators and also from creators towards brands. And already, I should say, I, you know, I represent many clients who, who are on the creator side going after brands who have done things like, you know, fail to pay or or use the creator's content without permission things of that nature um so that's that's the big reason why you want to get a corporate entity it's liability protection the second is branding okay if you want to build a brand that's outside of your own creator name then creating a corporate entity with that brand name can help not only do you protect that name legally because now you have it and it's yours uh, but you actually get your own process started as a business person thinking through okay well how do i want to project this business if it's not just me anymore, like what is my brand? What does it stand for? So it helps a little bit on that front. And lastly, it can help on the taxation front to get one of these entities. I'm not an accountant. I'm an attorney, as we know. So I'm not going to get super in the weeds here. But the short version is things like an LLC or an S Corp can potentially help you pass through losses from your business onto other income that you have. So if you're making a ton of money from other ventures, it's possible that if you use one of these entities, that uh, the, the losses from your creation, let's say you bought like a $10,000 camera. I know it's expensive, but for example, then you could potentially pass that $10,000 loss onto income you make from your day job, for example. But of course, I think you should check with accountants before and to confirm. We did get a good question on that one. Is it common for brand deals to include a personal guarantee clause to attempt to penetrate that corporate veil? Wow, Papa Juggernaut, you uh, you have a you have a, a great legal background, my friend, to to use that phrase, piercing the corporate veil. So you, for your guys' benefit, piercing the corporate veil is a a, a legal uh, it's a doctrine where courts will say, even though you have an LLC or a C corporation or or that legal shield, we think that you guys who own it, you've you've used the business basically as a personal funnel for all of your personal things. So we're not going to honor that liability protection. We're going to pierce the corporate veil and allow the person suing you to recover anything that you own in addition to what the corporate entity owns. And so what Papa is asking is, will a brand basically contract to get around the liability protection and say, hey, creator, even though you have that shield, we are still entitled to go after all of your personal assets. The answer Papa, is that I have rarely seen that, maybe one time in the hundreds of agreements that I've reviewed. And keep in mind that even if there is a clause that states in the contract that, you know, the, the individual is, is agreeing to guarantee, unless it's built out and actually compliant with, you know, like the UCC, which is the Universal Code of Contracts, and you, in addition to that, 
has the individual signature in addition to the corporate entity signature, you need both in that case. It's unlikely something like that would be honored in court. But in general, to answer your question directly, mm -hmm. uh, it's very rare, very rare. I haven't, I haven't seen it. And, um, and really good question. So real quick, what are the corporate entities? We'll do a quick overview. The one you've probably heard of the most is an LLC, limited liability company. These are the ones that I typically recommend for creator clients because they're the simplest. They basically allow you on the taxation side to treat your income as pass through or elect it to be treated as a C corporation. What that basically means is if you elect for the income and, and the losses of an LLC to be a pass through, that goes back to the example that we talked about on the previous slide where all of the money or the losses that the LLC had will go to your personal income. And you can then use those losses or income as it were to offset other ventures that you have that are completely unrelated to the LLC. Not only that, you avoid double taxation. So the way the US tax code works for corporations is that if a C corporation makes money, makes a hundred bucks, the C corporation is taxed. I think at most right now it's like 15% or 20%. Trump's tax code um, or his tax cuts lowered it. So uh, let's say it's 20%. Then when that C corporation gives money to the person who owns it or the employees, that person is taxed again at the regular personal income rates, whatever that is for you, depending on your tax bracket. Two layers of taxation. That's just how it works. But when you have an LLC, you can avoid that first layer of taxation completely. And you just take the income right down to the creator or the individual that owns the LLC. And it's just treated as personal income. You avoid the corporate tax layer entirely. So because of its flexibility and simplicity, I recommend LLCs most often. C corporations, they're just more complex. And they're more traditionally the case if you want to create like a startup company that goes and chases venture capital funding. That's when I'd recommend uh, doing something like a C corporation. Touch briefly on partnerships. They're really not for creators. Typically partnerships or LLPs are for specialized areas of service providers like legal, like myself or accounting. Um, and, and generally they operate very similar to an LLC in terms of the taxation structure. And lastly, an S corporation. Now you may have heard that you need to file as an S corporation. Well, here's a dirty little secret. There's actually no such thing as filing as an actual S corporation. An S corporation is a tax election that you make. So the first step for creating any corporate entity, you know, you file the form, you get the LLC, you get the C corp. If you want to become an S corporation, then in addition to that, you have to file a form directly with the IRS saying, hey, I declare that I am now an S corporation. And there's requirements for what, you know, what it is to be an S corporation. You have to have a certain number of shareholders and you have to do it within a certain number of days after you file the entity. The basic thing you need to know is that an S corporation helps you on the taxation side. It's very similar to how an LLC operates in that you can avoid the double layer of taxation. For example, in my law firm, that's what I'm doing. Instead of just using my four creators by creators entity, because then I would get taxed on the corporate income. And then when I pay myself, I would get taxed again. I elected to be an S corporation. So now I'm only taxed when I receive the money and the corporation is not taxed at the, uh, at the higher rate. Now you might wonder when should I do it? You know, there's no right or wrong here. I tell people when your annual revenue is exceeding $15,000, then it might be time. It might be time to take it more seriously now and, and start protecting yourself. If it's below that, Frankly, I just don't think it's worth the money and the time and the management to, to take care of the LLC. You know, most LLC or, or C corporation, you know, these entities, you, you need to pay annual fees to the state in which you incorporate. So it's not free. You also need to pay somebody at the very beginning to create it for you. I recommend using a lawyer and not using companies like LegalZoom or like form LLC now $100 because um, many times those, those businesses don't give you an adequate operating agreement off the bat and an operating agreement for your benefit is like the, the constitution of the business. And, um, and it's important that that reflects your business's needs and also includes, um, you know, various protections for you as the actual owner of the company. And th these companies don't care about that, right? All they're looking for is a quick buck to file with the state give you the proof that you have an entity and then they move on. Um, but I've had many clients who come to me and they need a lot of cleanup because, because those businesses didn't actually do a good job reflecting what they need. 
Okay, let's move on from corporate entities. And doesn't look like we have any questions specifically on that. So we'll get right at the trademark and real quick. Um, you know, trademarking is important for you guys because as creators, your intellectual property is more or less the value you're bringing to the table. And this is especially the case for bigger creators or creators that have side businesses uh, that, that are selling, you know, apparel or a product or even, even a course at times. What trademarking does is it gives your intellectual property a higher level of protection than otherwise exists. For your benefit, you know, whenever you publish something, whether it's a piece of content or a brand name, uh, you have general common law copyright protection. It's not like you're out there running naked and anybody can steal what you do and you have no recourse. You have some protection simply because you put something out there that is yours and it's published and the United States law recognizes that. The problem is your remedies are somewhat limited if somebody steals your work. It, you know, the amount of money that you can recover is probably going to be lower to actually go into court and litigate and say, look, they stole my work. I had it copyrighted because I published it before them. Uh, it's a lot harder to make that argument compared to when you have a registered and published trademark with the U.S. Patent Office. So the short version is trademarking is like the high, not the highest, but but a very high level of protection for your intellectual property assets. Typically what those assets are, it's like your, you know, your stage name as a creator. It could be a logo for your brand. It could be the brand name and it's not cheap to get a trademark. Okay. So the USPTO charges at minimum $250 per class of goods that you want the trademark to protect. And on top of that, you have to pay an attorney. And I would definitely recommend paying an attorney for trademark. If you're not going to do it for the C, C Corporation, LLC, corporate formation, uh, you should absolutely do it for trademarking because trademarking is pretty complex. You need to search and make sure that there's no existing trademarks that cover what you want. And uh, and then you have to file the application. And then the USPTO gets back to you with comments. You have to go back and forth with them. It's, it's, it's a complicated process. Um, but, you know. When you do it, I think is when your brand or your business is making more than a hundred thousand dollars annually. Prior to that, the same sort of reasoning applies for the corporate formation. It's just it's a lot of money, and if you're not pulling in enough revenue to justify it, I question whether it's the right time. And also, remember, even if you don't have the trademark, um, it's it, it you still have protection under general common law copyright law so so it's not like you're running out there without uh without any protection so wasn't, that said, there, wasn't there a big drama a couple of years ago about kylie jenner trying to trademark her name kylie and then kylie minogue um who many of you gen zers may not know but uh was a big singer back in the day um came up against her and basically said that's people's name and you can't trademark it yes right well and you know i i, I don't remember how the case resolved but one thing to remember is even when somebody can try to trademark something, they have to go through a rigorous process with the USPTO to get it approved. And for something like their name, like Kylie, just trying to trademark Kylie, that's incredibly tough because that's so broad that the USPTO is going to say, everybody is going to use that in various contexts. You can't just own it, which is most likely how the case turned. If I had to guess, unless there was some like, it was a specific text, you know, and it was the logo Kylie with, you know, a star as with, with the eye or some like fancy, you know, font, then, then I could see that. But yeah. But yeah. Some, it, it, someone yeah, in the on. chat, we have a couple questions. Um, Howie says, I federally trademarked my brand name, but does that still protect me against content video theft? So it, it generally, it does not because the trademark will protect your name. Whatever you trademark, that's the thing that's protected. So Howie, in your case, if you trademark to the brand name, what it's gonna protect against is somebody else coming along and trying to use your brand name in the same line of business. And you can go to them and say, hey, you have to change your business name because I already trademarked mine. The people stealing the, the video content, that's common law copyright infringement. And you can still go after them the trademark just wouldn't necessarily apply in that case, but they're still infringing on your copyright and you still have a claim against them. And uh, Judy asks, what if your brand name is your actual name? Then you would, then you would file a trademark of the actual name. Now it might be a little risky? weird. 
It might be a little weird. Yeah. I mean, it, there, there's a, there's, there's a chance it's not going to get accepted if it's quite simply just your name without any qualifiers or, or, uh, business related terms. So don't be surprised if it gets rejected, but if it's a stage name, I don't think it is. Cause I think you're saying that it's your, your actual legal name. If it's a stage name, then usually the stage name works just fine. But if it's there your, have if, been a few high profile situations. I'm thinking of like Kate Spade handbags, um, or Haley Page right. wedding dresses. Those were people, they used their real name as the brand name and then the brand got bought and somebody else owned their name and their brand. Um, right. if, you, if you're interested and you Google Haley Page wedding dresses name controversy or something like that, um, there was a really, really interesting story about um, her inability to use her own name to continue design wedding dresses after her company got bought. So think twice, I would say. Right. As someone who's not a lawyer and has no experience at all, <laughs> um, yeah. think think about whether you want your real name to be your brand name or, um, you know, something yeah. else. Yeah, that's 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 definitely interesting and and a absolutely a risk that that you're taking if you decide to tie your personal name to the brand. It no longer really is your asset at that point. It's the company's asset, and so if the company gets bought or sold, the name goes with it. And Judy, to answer your question, whatever you want the brand to project, if you want the brand to project your personal name, that's the thing that you're you're going to trademark. You know, how does the process work for trademarking? Like I said earlier, you want to work with an attorney on it. They'll prepare an application. You file it. Trademark takes a while. Right now, the USPTO is turning applications nine to 12 months after they're submitted. In that meantime, you're allowed to say that you have trademarked it. You can use the little trademark logo but it's not actually formalized yet. And you know, there's a chance that it gets rejected. So it's not, it's definitely not foolproof. Switching gears a little bit here. I wanted to touch briefly on brand deal red flags. So, you know, one of the main ways that creators monetize is through brand deals. Somebody comes to you says, Hey, you know, we have a product, your audience, you know, your audience will resonate with, we'll pay you a thousand bucks, do a video on it. And these are the agreements that I handle a lot of my practice where creators are just getting stiffed left and right. So I wanted to touch on some of these terms real quick. The big thing that you should look out for as a creator is the rights to your intellectual property, because the intellectual property is your brand as a creator, your name, your image, your likeness, uh, the content that you're actually producing for the brand. In these contracts, often the brand will give themselves the unlimited right to use your name, image, and likeness and the content that you're producing basically forever. And that's obviously unreasonable. I mean, if, 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 if they want that much of your brand, then they should be paying for it, but often they aren't. Um, so you want to, you want to keep a lookout for that, you know, owning your intellectual property, the brand having perpetual rights, name, image, likeness, you know, this is less less major of an issue, but anything more than having two rounds of revisions from the brand side, I think is unreasonable. And for your benefit here, I think most of you probably know what I'm talking about, but when you submit a piece of content, typically the brand has an option to tell you, okay, I want this changed. I don't like this. Can you refilm this? And there's a contractual right for them to do that. But I just think anything more than two is unreasonable. So be careful, be careful signing on to more than two, because that means the brand typically is very, very finicky and picky, almost to the point of like micromanaging you as a creator, which isn't ideal. Net payment longer than 60 days. If you're getting paid, when you're getting paid, I should say, you should not be getting paid longer than 60 days after the content goes live. I personally negotiate these to be zero net zero payment, as in you're paying me the day that I post the content. Why would I have to wait? There's no reason for me to wait. I, I gave you what the service provided for. That's my positioning negotiating wise. And it doesn't always work. Some brands, a lot of them, they're like, oh, well, this is the way it is. And um, we can't do more than that. Or, you know, we can at, we can at most, we can cut it down to 30 days, but beyond that, we're not allowed to, we don't have the authorization, but just push them on it. You don't, you don't lose anything by trying. Um, the brand being non-responsive, that's not great. There's a lot of shady actors in this industry, a ton of foreign companies that that are just trying to make a quick buck and get quick advertising hits for their for their products. But they're also inconsistent. They're they're sketchy. You know, they won't pay. They'll use creators content without permission. And I've noticed that if a brand is non-responsive, that's one of the signs that you're probably dealing with one of these people. So don't be surprised if they're being non-responsive. You end up signing a deal. You do the content and then oh, they ghost on you and they disappear and you have no way of getting the money, 
um, that's a red flag from the onset that they were being non-responsive. And how do I know this? Well, you guys can probably guess because I have a lot of experience negotiating these deals. Um, and, and these are the major red flags that, that I think you should look out for. Generally, uh, you know, and this is, this is more of a mindset negotiating thing I wanted to talk to you guys about. Don't be afraid to ask for more when you talk to brands. There's, there's a myth out there. I think it's, it's a common one in business in general that if you ask, you're going to like scare them away. It's never happened once to any of my clients. And, and I'm the one, you know, redlining these contracts and I'm pretty aggressive with the changes that I asked for. A brand has never, ever said, okay, this is unreasonable. I can't believe you're asking for that. We're walking away. Never once happens. So don't be afraid. Ask for more money. Cut the payment terms down. Uh, carve out your right to your own intellectual property. Obviously, some of these terms are complex legalese. You may need an attorney to help you, but uh, to the extent you know what the terms are doing and saying, push for terms that are better for you. And, um, you know, management companies, agencies, social media managers, they're not lawyers. Some of them will tell you they're going to redline and they're going to they're going to negotiate these agreements for you. The only thing that these agreements understand are the basic business terms like, OK, net payment this number of days, whitelisting rights for this number of days. But they don't understand and know how to negotiate the more complex terms, some of which we don't have time to get into today. But, you know, indemnification, limitation of liability, even name, image and likeness. They're not lawyers, so they're, they're not going to be able to some degree, they don't have the skill set or the background. And also, frankly, they're not, they're not that vested in you as a creator and your rights. Like they're looking to make their 20%. But beyond that, like it's your problem as a creator and they're looking out for themselves. So just be wary of them. Don't rely fully on them for, for the legal expertise. And of course, shameless plug, you know, have an attorney review these agreements for you. Um, you know, my firm offers very affordable, accessible rates and also even a percentage of gross revenue for, for brand deals, because I want to stay accessible to creators. So even if you have a brand deal, that's like $500, I can still review it for you. And it'll be very cheap for you. Uh, because I think personally that it's important to protect creators rights in general. Now, if you want to learn more about the brand deal terms themselves and how to protect your own rights, and also look at what these terms, uh, see what these terms look like in a vacuum. I created a course for protecting your rights in brand deals. It's $100 flat, and it includes a creator-friendly brand deal contract template, which you can use in your own brand deals. Really, the purpose of this is to educate and empower you as a creator to know what you're signing on to and to better negotiate deals for yourself in the future. If you are interested in that, uh, the link is in my beacons, just an FYI. And of course, look, you can always drop me a line uh, if you want to do a free consult and talk through the issues you're facing. It's, it's like I said, it's free. There's no strings attached. None of that. I'm not like one of these big law firms that's going to charge you like seven grand for a tiny little thing. Like that's not my style. I'm very much out here to, to help and promote the creator economy. So that is it for the slides. I know we got some questions in and there's also a bunch of questions in the Q&A tab. So let me run through first uh, some of these questions we received in the chat and then we'll yeah. get into the, the Q&A tab too. Yeah. Well, you take a quick look there. I will just say... Um, yeah, if you are concerned about brand deals and negotiating brand deals, um, right now, just anecdotally, uh, managers and and creators, I think, are seeing um, brands and creators are starting further apart than they ever have been in the conversation for negotiations and and deals. Um, so it's as much help as you can get, right? From Julian, from a lawyer, from a manager, from us at Beacons, we have tons of resources. Um, if you feel like you're in over your head a little bit here, um, that's normal and you're not alone and we're here yeah. to help you and Julian's here to help you. So I hope you guys can yes, take advantage completely. of this. I did drop the link to Julian's brand deal pointers guide in the chat um, and I will share it again at the end in case it gets buried by other questions. So yeah. thank you for that amazing presentation. Um, and with that, yeah, we will start answering some of these awesome yeah, questions. You're, you're, guys. Listen, you're very welcome. And, and guys, as a reminder, the, uh, the thing that, Isabel just linked that's free and you guys get that for signing up for this webinar and it's a one pager on you know red flags and green flags and brand deal courses but if you want the more built out course that's going to be in the beacons in my own beacons link somebody asked if the if the course is uh, specific to any state and it is not because the course is addressing contract law in general which applies regardless of the state you're in uh, so it's not limited to any specific state it's a good question and Lila, I'm very sorry to hear about that brand ripping you off. That's um, I, I wish I could say that I'm surprised, but it's such a common thing that's been happening these days. 
um, I, I hope that, you know, you stood up for yourself and, and, and told them strongly, you know, that they need to take it down, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to chat about it anytime, you let me know. Francisco, same thing. Just drop me an email and, and we can chat. Um, yeah. How we asked, do you have advice to file copyright infringement? TikTok actually accept it. Oh, man. Okay. So here's the problem is government does not regulate these, pl these platforms pretty much at all. Uh, and because of that, it's purely the the platforms are doing whatever they care to do for the creator community out of the goodness of their hearts but as you can probably imagine uh the goal of these companies is to make a lot of money helping creators and putting a ton of money into supporting the creator side of their business doesn't actually make them a lot of money what makes them a lot of money is uh pushing content and optimizing advertisements to get advertisers to pay them uh for for paid listings so i think with that context you want to be as detailed as possible. So if somebody's infringing on your content, you be as detailed as possible. You you link to the infringing piece. You say, this is infringing. You say, here's the original. And then you say, uh, I need to take it down now. It's an infringement. And if you don't, I'm going to file a lawsuit. Even if you don't have a lawyer, even if you don't intend to file a lawsuit, you just need to get their attention because these platforms are inundated, especially TikTok. TikTok is, it's it's obviously young it does not have the same sort of layers of protection and institutional infrastructure for dealing with IP issues like YouTube. I think YouTube is much better. Um, so you just really need to make a lot of noise and don't be afraid to file like multiple claims with them to like continue until you get a response from them. And by the way, even if they say, no, we're not going to do anything, just keep going, just keep filing, just keep filing. Um, I had a client who had their account locked and banned because they like, I don't even remember, it was something esoteric. They like talked about somebody and it was considered bullying. Mm -hmm. And they just kept hammering on the door saying, you need to unban me, you need to unban me. And TikTok said, no, we're not gonna unban you. And I told her, just keep going, just ignore the no. And she kept going and then eventually she got unbanned. So I think just be as detailed as possible. Um, any insights how to proceed legally when websites do not comply with the DMCA? Um, that's interesting, Britt. I'd ask you to clarify, are you talking about quite like, are you talking about going after somebody that isn't complying or are you talking about protecting yourself, making sure you are, you are compliant? Is the brand deal guidance point applicable outside of the US example in Africa? Yes, it is. It is. I mean, generally the law that I'm talking about is US based. Keep that in mind, you know, copyright law, trademarking, like those issues don't necessarily apply, but the contractual principles absolutely apply. And I'm going to hop back to the chat in a second, but before I do, I'm going to go to the Q&A and answer some of these in the Q&A section real quick. Yeah. So we can pop these up on the screen. Only the very beginning will be visible. Um, and I do want to just preface this by saying thank you. And we appreciate um, how many of you took the time to write very long, very detailed, very personal situation specific questions. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the answer to many of those is going to be um, potentially book a free consultation with Julian or, um, you know, look to the brand deal course, we're not going to be able to get too into personal specific situations, but we will do our best um, for Julian to answer sort of the general tone of some of these. Yeah, exactly. So this, and oh, go ahead. Isabel. This first one is just, um, you know, if you make your own contract in Microsoft Word, um, maybe have it notarized, like, is this legal? Yeah. And the answer is yes, you can absolutely make your own contract and you don't even need to get it notarized. Notarization helps verify the identity of the people signing, but it doesn't actually like uh, superimpose a deeper sense of legality in the agreement. So you can 100% create your own contract. Um, here, absolutely. Here, here we have, how much can I charge for a late payment fee if I don't want to charge monthly interest? Yeah, I, I recommend like 50 bucks a day. Something that's like punch, punchy, but not crazy high. Yeah, but it could be, it could be anything. There's no right or wrong there. I like this one too. I'm young and I don't have the capital to invest in a lawyer with other business expenses. What resources do you recommend? Do you have any, Julian? You dropped a few. Um, yeah, but what would you recommend? Yeah, obviously, besides the stuff that you know I'm doing with the course and whatnot, I think ChatGPT is great. Paste the contract term in there and ask it, what is this saying? Can you explain this to me? Like I'm five and then see what it says. And then you know, dive deeper if you still don't understand it. Ask it to clarify. Can you give me an example? Uh, and if you if you want to try to get it to lawyer for you, you can. Just you know, understand this is it's risky. You're, you're there's there's many times it's not going to give you what it is you're actually seeking because it's not perfect. AI is definitely not perfect yet, but it's a great tool. 
So I think it's a great educational tool and and one that you can use potentially for very basic contract terms to, to say, hey, draft this for me. I want it to do X, Y, Z. Love that. Um, Francisco asked, uh, it's been 30 days since I delivered the contract and the agency hasn't paid me. Um, the agency is claiming the brand is behind schedule on payments. How can I resolve this or what can I do to prevent this situation in the future? Yeah, so... Um, I'll answer the second part first. Unfortunately for prevention, you besides adding in like a payment penalty fee and saying that like the brand the brand waives any and all rights to to uh, to, to 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 court and they they will they will immediately pay like just like really formalizing like you will do this if I ask. Um, there's not a whole lot you can do on the preventative side. So I think like a a penalty at the beginning is probably your best bet saying, Hey, every day after this date that it's not paid, you're going to own extra $50 and you waive any right to contest that in court. Now, what should you do if a, if a brand does not pay you, you go after them aggressively. You stay on them every single day after the payment day, asking for an update, demanding an update. Um, you contact an attorney like me potentially to get involved and send, you know, a strongly worded email because unfortunately uh, in our system, when you have a lawyer send something, it has more weight and gravitas typically than, you know, a, a, a typical customer or, or creator. And if you are willing to, I think putting pressure on the brand publicly is also a good strategy. And you go out and you say, look, this brand hasn't paid me for my work. It's been 45 days instead of the 30. I've emailed and I've texted them and they've not responded to me and I don't know what to do, but I just think it's so unfair and you'll get, you know, obviously people in your community to come and, and, and support you and DM the brand and start like going into the brand's comment section and whatnot. You know, I'm not like, it's not great to start drama. It's not ideal. And, I, you know, we're, most of us are not on these platforms to start drama with brands. At the same time, you need to use your voice and you have the, every right to protect yourself if they're not paying you. So that's what I would that's what I'd say. Just keep keep the pressure up. This one just came in. What happens if a creator makes an ad post and doesn't include or disclose hashtag ad per new regulations? Yeah, very good question. You you run the risk of the FTC coming after you and fining you. It's it's federal law that if you are advertising a product or service, it needs to have a conspicuous disclosure that it's an advertisement, which means hashtag ad, hashtag sponsored, hashtag paid partnership. It has to be clear. It cannot be hidden. So for on Instagram, for example, you cannot have your caption and then two dots and then hashtag ad. That's not obvious enough. It needs to be like literally right in their face. Hashtag ad and then boom, the caption. Um, but, but you know, if you're small, it's kind of like jaywalking. Uh, maybe that's not the best example. But right now, like this economy is young and like the FTC, they got bigger stuff to fry. Like if you're a small creator doing a 50, you know, $500 brand deal, like if you don't do this, are you going to get fined? Probably not. Should you do it? Um, I don't think so. This is not like jaywalking in the sense that what you're doing is permanent. It's it's on the internet. It can most likely be found even if you delete it. It can be found somewhere, especially if the United States government wants to find it, like they're going to find it. So um, there's a permanent record here. And I think you should think about that as well. Like in, in 10 years, perhaps the government will come up with a very like small small version of FTC enforcement that goes after smaller creators, or maybe the platform is going to start doing it where they're going to say, uh, we're going to ban your account if you don't comply. They theoretically have that right right now, but they just aren't exercising it because um, they know that that'll cause more problems for them and they have no incentive to ban creators in that way. So anyway, you can get fined, but I still don't recommend that you run that risk. Yeah. Um, great question in the chat here. If the late payment fee was not in the contract, can I introduce it after the fact? Um, or what steps would I take in that situation? No, typically no. Um, the contract is what the contract says, unless they agree explicitly to new terms. You can propose it, but it's unlikely they're going to agree. Um, so, so you're typically bound by what the contract said at the onset. And when websites refuse to remove content um, and say it falls under fair use, even if it doesn't, how can one proceed? I have a guess about this. Hire a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah, I think, you know, you can you can get an attorney. The first thing I'd say without getting an attorney is to threaten legal action. So say, like, if you don't do this, then I'm going to have to lawyer up and then maybe that'll move them. If it doesn't, you can get an attorney. If you don't want to get an attorney to help, 
Um, there is a small claims copyright court that was just opened and it's in Washington, DC, but it's all virtual and it's small claims. So it's anything I believe under $30,000 of damages. And so something like that would fall under the purview of that small claims copyright court. And it's, it's very simple. It's meant to be for the public, not for attorneys. So you go on there and you just file your claim. You say, this is how they're infringing. This is the damages that I want. Um, here's the evidence. And then you pay like, you know, I think it's like 100, 150 bucks or something to file it. So it's, you know, it's going to cost a little bit of money, but um, that's one way to fight it without an attorney. Awesome. Um, this one, I think we did answer in your presentation. You went over the difference. Um, but if you still have questions on that one in particular, Lila, let us know what you're still confused about in the chat. I'm just clearing questions from my queue here really quickly. Will it be recorded and available to watch afterwards? Yes, right here on the landing page as soon as we, as soon as we um, close the event. Uh, Someone I asked one interesting one, a vocalist creating oh, yeah. content and you know, they're talking about how some people use tracks in the background to sing along to, um, and, and, you know, those, those songs presumably are not their own. And the second is what are the laws if they wanted to upload a voiceover of a, an existing song? And it, you know, for example, like a song from Disney's Encanto, um, you should be, first of all, if you're using existing music tracks, especially from, from big names like Disney, it's very unlikely the platforms or Disney are going to allow it to stay up, even if you're changing the vocals on it. If you're using the same instrumentals, um, it's unlikely it's, it's going to be allowed to stay up because it's going to be deemed copyright infringement. And these the music industry is very protective of their IP. Um, so unlike the creator world where we can like steal each other's videos willy nilly, um, you're not going to get the same sort of leeway on the music side. So I think uh, you can experiment with how different you need to make the track. That's what I'd recommend is if you can't get like the consent from Disney to say, hey, like Disney has allowed me to do this and I have the contract. If, if you think that's out of the question, then um, just continue experimenting with, OK, I'll change the vocals and then maybe I'll like change the tempo and I'll raise the, I'm not a musician, but I'll raise like the, the pitch of the entire instrumental. Maybe that's different enough because you can absolutely change something enough to the point that it falls under fair use. Um, but where that line is, um, it's, 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 it's a gray area. I'll put it that way. And it's something that I think you'll have to, you'll have to continue experimenting on. This is kind of related when a trademark does not cover a particular use case, like it covers t-shirts, jackets, right. and other clothing, how legal is it to use it for other items like jewelry or placards? It's completely um, legal. So a trademark only covers the classes that they're registered for. If it, if it only covers clothing, then you can use that trademark, the name, the logo, whatever it is, you can use it for anything else that is not clothing because trademark pr trademark protection is only specific to the classes that the person registered them under. So you're you're in the clear. Cool, and Francisco asked a follow up in the chat to the previous conversation um, about putting public pressure on brands. What if we signed an NDA but haven't gotten paid? Can we legally do anything? Mm, it's a little bit riskier if there is an NDA, but typically NDAs do not cover I guess, I, okay, first of all, the the classic lawyer answer, it depends. But it depends because NDAs sometimes don't cover the terms of, uh, you know, for example, if a brand is paying you late, that's not confidential information. Um, and so if you're disclosing things that you can actually, you're legally allowed to disclose pursuant to the, whatever NDA you signed, then you should be okay. Now, if the NDA explicitly does cover you know, any and all relationships you have with the brand, the fact that the agreement exists at all, the amount of money, when it was due, uh, it's riskier because the brand then has the right to say that you breached the contract. And because you breached the contract, we are no longer, in, uh, we are no longer required to pay you. Uh, yeah, you because... could still privately attempt to enforce the contract terms um, if you were choosing not to go public though, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. That that's a great that's a great question though, and and definitely something to keep in mind when and if you decide um, to go public about it. Also, keep in mind though that like 
if you're deciding to go public, it usually means that you have no choice left and they haven't paid you yet. So you don't really have much to lose. And there's not really a claim for them to come after you for any money if you violate the terms of an NDA for something as esoteric as, hey, the brand didn't pay me. You know, if you're if you're spilling like their trade secrets, that's a bigger deal. They can probably come after you for damages. But like if you're just out there saying, hey, look, they didn't pay me yet. They were supposed to pay me on this day. Even if they say, oh, you breached the contract, we're going to come after you. Like they can't come after you for anything like the damages for that are, are zero. They're not going to be able to prove that. Um, so, yeah, um, you guys have asked so many amazing questions. Uh, thank you all so much for that. There are a few questions left in the question box. However, uh, most of them are very specific, personal, detailed situations. So we're going to just recommend those of you who maybe submitted those and didn't get them answered um, to follow up with Julian in a consult. Um, if, I'm not sure if this is one that you want to address or can address. How do you, what's a term, how do you write a termination clause? What is a termination clause? Yeah. And and by the way, um, Lila, some of these questions, like a lot of them are actually the, the exact thing that I address in the brand deal course. Like I, I walk you through what all of these terms mean. I give you examples of them. I, I talk on camera and I lecture about them. So just, just an FYI there, uh, you know, on the termination clause question specifically, very, very important clause. A termination clause is the clause that says, how can these people leave the agreement? How am I as a creator allowed to say, I no longer want to do this, this deal at all. I want to walk away it's even more important for signing on with management agencies because these management agencies right now, what they try to do is lock you into 12 month agreements with like perpetual renewals and they don't let you leave. I've had clients come to me, huge creators and their agencies lock them into like three year deals and the creator wants to leave. The agency says, we'll let you leave, but you have to pay us $150,000 if you want to leave working with us, which is crazy. I mean, it's insane for so many reasons like this. For me, it's insane. I, I'm thinking about the agency is the one that's supposed to be bringing money to the creator. How are they now holding the creator hostage? Um, all of this is an issue because the contract does not provide for a simple termination right on behalf of the creator. And, you know, when you ask like how to draft one, I would defer to chat GPT, right? It's going to tell you, here's a basic termination clause. But in, in essence, it just says, I can terminate this agreement by giving three days notice to the other party. That's it. Just very simple, right? I'm allowed to terminate for this reason or for no reason. Um, often in these deals, you're not going to see a unilateral termination, right? Which means um, the termination rights not going to be uh, like the creator can't just do it. The, the brand will typically say we can terminate whenever we want, but creator, if you want to terminate, then you need to have all these conditions satisfied. You know, the brand has to have breached the agreement three times. You need to have given us notice about it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something I edit quite often for clients is, um, is the termination provisions to give them a clear way out. Perfect. Um, slight side note, Katie asked, um, do brands, are they put off by someone who has a manager? Is it better to work independently as a creator? Um, I would just refer you to our Ask a Manager series on the Beacons YouTube. Um, we've addressed this in the past, if you're interested in that. Um, I don't know if you have an opinion, Julian, or... <laughs> no, my, my, two, my two cents is it doesn't make a difference. I don't think brands care either way. As long as you're just responding and being like, you know, competent, I don't think it matters. That's a great take. Um, all right. Anybody has a, if anybody has a final question, oh, Cleo, kind of a follow-up to Francisco about the NDA. The terms say you can't talk neg about them negatively on social media, but are you saying if you don't release the company name, you know, if you sort of talk about this anonymous company, um, that seems risky to me. <laughs> I'm, trying, can, I'm trying to find the question. Yeah, it's about fourth from the bottom right now. Um, yeah, Cleo says, yes, like, so they, you have an NDA, it says you can't speak negatively about the company on social media, but can you yeah. still say, you know, this anonymous brand did, did me wrong? Yes. Yes. So if you're, so first of all, if, if it's a non-disparagement and it's clear that the language in the non-disparagement non says like, you're not allowed to say things that'll bring the brand into public, you know, dispute or scandal, et cetera, et cetera that does not mean that you can't state the facts. And the facts are, this brand was supposed to pay me on this day. It did not pay me. That's not disparaging the brand. Disparaging the brand would be like, Coca-Cola tastes like cancer, and it's like, it's ugly, and their their logo sucks, and red is such a gross cut. Like, that's, you know, that's disparaging them. But you can state the facts. And beyond that, I think your question was addressing anonymity. 
where you change the the way you you bring it up um yes you can if you are not clearly identifying the brand and think about this from a reasonable person's standard because that's most likely the standard that will be used if this ever goes to court would a reasonable person be able to deduce from your post who you're talking about if they could then that's basically the same thing as you saying the name. But if they can't, then you can go right ahead because you have a freedom of speech in this country and the First Amendment protects that. And if if you're not actually referring to the brand or doing it you know, very obviously, then you're well within your right. So if you were to say an ath- athletic wear brands that I won't name, that would be all right, but rhymes with moo moo, Right. Yes. <laughs> Does it? Well, yes. Also, though, one thing to keep in mind is if you are talking about a brand deal you did and anyone can go to your page and scroll and find the brand deals you did, then you should be careful with how much you disclose. So, for example, in that example, Isabel, if you say, oh, yeah, I have this athletic wear brand that didn't pay me and then they scroll and there's there's only, you know, one athletic wear brand that they did a deal with, then suddenly the brand can say, you're constructively outing us because everybody knows that it's us, uh, Lululemon or you know what what have you, because we're the only brand you worked with. Um, so, Amazing. just one wrinkle to think about. Well, it seems like we have come to the end of the questions that you guys had. Um, so I while I'm, oh, one more. Yeah, from a marketing perspective, the brand is afraid of your representation. You should be avoid. Oh, sorry, never mind. I guess that's not a question, more of a comment. Oh yeah, in response to the um, people, the person who asked uh, that previous question. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, yes, you. Thank you for saying that, Cleo. You are amazing, Julian. Thank you so much. You're for that. welcome, Cleo. Anytime. Um, Happy to help. We. I just appreciate this conversation so much. I think it's super interesting to talk about all of these different things. Um, I, I'm going to drop this link again to Julian's Brando Pointers Guide in case you missed it in the chat. Um, And also, if you want to be the first to know about fun, amazing, cool, informative events and content that we do at Beacons with incredible people like Julian, please join our community. I dropped that link in the chat as well. Um, So everybody leave a leave us a clap emoji or a thank you for Julian. Um, This for those of you who have asked, the recording will be available Um, right here on this same landing page as soon as we stop broadcasting live. Um, Very cool feature of Crowdcast. You can just go back immediately and like, you know, look for an answer or something. The chat also lives on here on this landing page. Um, So if you want to go back and find a link or ask a follow-up question, um, I check it back in from time to time. So you guys can do that as well. Um, And Julian's email address is still on the screen. So make sure you note that down reach out to him. We uh, just appreciate you guys so much for being here and for sticking with us through this amazing event. So uh, thank you again. And we're going to call it there. Have a great rest of your week, everybody. Thank you guys. Bye.